Simon says subscribe and click on the bell icon to receive notifications. We've made the files the instructor uses in this tutorial available for free. Just click the link below in the video details to get these. Hello everyone and welcome to this introductory course on Pandas. When I first decided to collaborate on a data mining project, I thought I need to write the code from scratch to do all the tasks such as reading data from a file, pre-processing data, deleting duplicates and irrelevant data, and so on. But with a little Google search, I found that there is a very powerful, flexible and easy to use library called Pandas that meets almost all the needs of a data analyst with minimal coding. In this video tutorial, I will be your host and I'm going to show you how to use Pandas in your data analysis projects. I'm Majid and I'm studying for a PhD in computer science at University of Victoria. I've been working in the field of data analysis and machine learning for more than six years. Also, I've been using Python as well as its libraries for about 10 years. I hope to be able to share my experience and knowledge with you in this video course. Well, let's know a little bit about Pandas before we start the course. Pandas is an open source library written for Python that is widely used for data analysis and machine learning. Pandas works well with many other data science modules inside the Python ecosystem, such as Matplotlib, which is used for data visualization, and Scikit-Learn, which is probably the most useful library for machine learning in Python. Pandas is built on top of another well-known Python library named NumPy, which provides many functionalities for multidimensional arrays. Generally, if you are going to be hired as a data scientist in future, it's one of those essential skills you need to learn. It can help you to simply do many of the time-consuming and repetitive tasks associated with working with data. These can include loading and saving data, data cleansing, data pre-processing and normalization, merges and joins, data visualization, statistical analysis, data inspection, and much more. In fact, with Pandas, you can do everything you need to do in a data analysis project and this course will show you how to do these tasks. So, if you are a person working with lots of data or you are going to be hired as a data analyst, this course would be helpful for you. Now, it's time for us to move into our first lesson. Take a short break and join me in the next video. Hello and welcome to the first video of Pandas introductory course. In this video, we are going to install everything we need to use Pandas. In order to use Pandas, we first need to install Python, which is the programming language. After that, we should install Pandas library to be able to use it. And also, I want to show you how to install Jupyter Notebook, which is a code editor. The third item is optional, but I strongly recommend to install and use it as a data scientist. Well, let's start with installing Python. As you see, I'm using Windows. If you're using another operating system, don't worry. The installation process on Mac is very similar to what you see here. And if you're using Linux, you don't need to install Python separately because Python is available on almost all of the Linux distributions. For those of you who have Python installed on your computer, you can skip this part and jump into Pandas installation. If you're not sure you have Python installed on your computer, just open command prompt window and then type python dash dash version. If the Python is already installed on your computer, then its version should be displayed here. And in this case, as I said, you can skip this part and jump into Pandas installation. On the other hand, if Python is not installed on your computer, you get an error message like this. Python is not recognized as an internal or external command. So to install Python, first we have to download it. Go to python.org and from the download menu, Click on this button, Python 3.10.4, which is the latest version of Python available at the time of recording this video. After downloading Python, the installation is straightforward. Just click on the downloaded file and click on the customize installation. In the first window, go ahead with default features and just click on the next button. In the second window, just check add Python to environment variables and if you want, you can modify the installation location down here. Finally, click on install button. Well done, you have successfully done the first step. 
and here just click close button. Now to make sure that the Python is installed, open the command prompt window and again type python dash dash version. This time I didn't get any error message and instead I see the version of Python available on my computer. After installing Python, it's time to install Pandas. To check if you have Pandas on your system, just enter the Python shell by typing Python in command prompt and then type import Pandas. As you see, I got an error message which says no module named Pandas. That means I don't have Pandas on my system. Now to install Pandas, first exit the Python shell by typing exit and then type pip install Pandas. Well done, the Pandas is now installed on our system. For verification, again enter the Python shell and then type import Pandas. As you see, this time I didn't get any error message. And to check the version of Pandas, I can say print pandas dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore. And this one for one is the version of Pandas I installed on my computer. Now everything is ready to use Pandas and run our codes. But let's install Jupyter Notebook as well. Jupyter Notebook is an interactive Python environment that helps us to run our code step by step and see the result at each step. To install Jupyter, we use pip command again. So first exit the Python shell by typing exit and then type pip install notebook. Okay, Jupyter has been installed successfully and now to run it, just type Jupyter notebook. Running Jupyter notebook opens my browser and on the top right corner, click on the new button and then click on Python 3. And here is your coding environment. Here in this rectangle, which is called a cell, you can type your code. For example, I type x equals one. And by pressing shift enter, I can run this cell. Now I say print x. And as you see, it works. Congratulations, you took the first step to become a data scientist. Now your data analysis toolbox is ready to use and you just need to learn how to use it. In the next video, we will start using Pandas and learn about two principal latest structures in Pandas. So stay with me in the next video. Hi there and welcome to the second chapter of Pandas training course. In the last chapter, we got acquainted with the Pandas library and installed all the necessary things to execute the code in Pandas on our system. At this point, I hope you have Python and Pandas installed on your system because in this chapter, we write codes using Pandas and enjoy its functionalities. In this chapter, I'm gonna introduce Pandas series and Pandas data frame, which are two basic data structures for storing data in Pandas. Next, you will see how to create these data structures and perform some basic operations. I will show you the difference between primary data structures in Python, like list and dictionaries, and these two Pandas structures, so you can clearly see what the advantages of using these data structures. You will also see how to import your data into a Pandas data frame and do some basic processing and explore your data. Well, as I said, Pandas has two data structures, including series and data frame. And both of these data structures are built on top of NumPy array, which makes them very fast and optimized. Let's start with series. Series is a one dimensional labeled array and capable of holding data of any type. It is heterogeneous, which means it can hold different data types, but in practice, it usually contains data with specific type. If we compare it with primary data structures in Python, series is a combination of list and dictionaries, but it supports lots of other functionalities. This is a sample series. It has two parts called index and values. Index is something like keys of a dictionary, which is used to access values. Here, indexes are zero to six, and values are 3.2, 3.5, and so on. Well, instead of talking about it, Let's jump into code and create series and see what it is and how it works. As I told you in the previous video, we use Jupyter Notebook to write and run our codes. To open Jupyter Notebook, first open command prompt window and then type Jupyter Notebook. In your browser, here on the top right corner, just click on the new button and then click on Python 3. This will create a new notebook where you can write your codes. 
Well, before working with pandas, we have to import it. So I type import pandas as pd. Pandas is usually imported as pd as a convention, like numpy, which is imported usually as np, or matplotlib as plt. Well, in Jupyter Notebook, each of these rectangles are called a cell. To run a cell, you have two options. You can click on run button on the top menu, or as a shortcut, you can hit shift enter on your keyboard. I prefer the second option because it's faster and more convenient. But before I hit shift enter, look at this empty bracket on the left side of each cell. When you run a cell, it first changes to a star, meaning that the cell is running, and then a number is assigned to the cell when the run is complete. So when you see a number next to a cell, it means that the execution of that cell is completed. Well, now let me hit shift enter and look at this bracket. You saw a star for a short period and then number one is shown here. It means that the execution of this cell is completed. It seems importing pandas has been done successfully because I didn't get any error message. By importing pandas as pd, we can access all classes and functions inside pandas library by typing pd dot and then type the name of class or function that you want to use. For example, as you saw in the previous video, we can check the version of our pandas library by typing pd dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore. And as you see, 1.0.3 is the version of pandas on my computer. Well done. Now everything is ready to work with pandas library. Let's get back to series. To create a series, you can call series class constructor from pd. So I type s1 equals to pd dot series with capital S because it is a class constructor and don't forget open and close parentheses. And if I show you a swan, you will see it's an empty series because we didn't pass any data to our series. If you are wondering now how to generate a series with data, I have to say it's very easy. You can pass data as the first input argument to series. For example, you can pass a list to series constructor to create a series with data. Here, I want to pass a list including numbers 1 to 5 as a data to series. And if I show you the result, you can see two columns. The first column is index and the second column is values. As I told you, series has two parts and we can access each part individually. If you want to access index, just type s2.index. As you see, index is a range index starting from 0 and a stop at 5. And similarly, if you want to get the values, you can type s2.values and you get the values of series. In this example, because we didn't explicitly specify index for s2, it automatically assigned numbers from 0 to 4 as index to our series. But you can also specify index for your series. For example, let's define s3 as a series including data 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and index equals to 10, 20, 30, 40 and 50. So I type s3 equals to pd.series as argument. First, I pass the data, a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and index equals to a list containing 10, 20, 30, 40 and 50. And let's see the result. This time, indexes are 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50, and the values are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Sometimes you need a string index. For example, suppose that you want to create a series which indexes are the name of students and the values are their scores. You can define the scores equals to pd.series and inside the parentheses, first pass the scores as a list, for example, 3.2, 4.5, 2.6, 5, and 3.8, and then pass a list of names as index argument by typing index equals to, for example, Bob, George, Alex, Fiona, and Sarah. Let's see the result. As you can see, indexes are the names in the left column and the scores as values are on the right column. Let's check the scores that index and the scores that values. 
Great job! To this point you know how to create a service from a list and how to specify index for your service. But we can also pass a dictionary as input argument to service class constructor. Let's try this one. First, let's create a dictionary which maps the name of students to their score. For example, D equals to Bob to 3.2, George to 4.5, Alex 2.6, Fiona 5, and Sarah 3.8. And now, let's pass the dictionary to service class constructor. So I type S4 equals to pd.series and then pass d as the data. Now let's see the result. Well, in this example, we didn't specify any index for our series. So the keys of dictionaries are used to create index for our series. And let's see s that index. As you can see, index are the names and s that values which are the scores for students. Hello and welcome back. In the previous video, I introduced pandas series, which was a one-dimensional array-like structure in pandas. A pandas data frame is the second primary data structure in pandas, which is a tabular data structure and it stores data in the form of rows and columns. Like other tabular data such as spreadsheets or SQL tables, in pandas data frame rows correspond to data records while columns refer to attributes. Later, you will see that pandas data frame is nothing but a collection of series. Well, to better understand pandas data frame, let me give you an example. Assume that you are a teacher and you would like to store your students' data in a table. Most likely, you design a table as follows that contains several columns, and each column stores information of one attribute for a student. For example, you can have one column for first name, one for last name, one for age, one for their program, and the last one for their score. Each row in the table represents a student. For example, the first student is Bob, whose last name is Williams, he is 26 years old, he is studying computer engineering and his score is 86. The information of other students is stored in the next rows in the same way. Well, this is exactly what a data frame is. This data frame has five columns and four rows. Later in this video, I will show you how to create pandas data frame. Let's jump into the code. Well, first, before everything else, we need to import pandas. So here I type import pandas as pd and now we can use pandas now let's start with creating an empty pandas data frame to create a pandas data frame we use data frame class constructor here i type df1 equals to pd.dataframe as you know python is case sensitive language so please note the letter d and f that are capital now let's see the type of our data frame it says that is a pandas data frame and let me to print it for you. Printing this data frame lets us know that this is an empty data frame and the columns and index are empty as well. You can also see the columns of a data frame using column attribute. So here I type df1.columns and the result is an index object which is a list-like structure and it's empty. Also, you can see the index of the data frame using index attribute. Again, the result is an empty index object. Now that you learned how to create an empty data frame, let's see how we can create a data frame that has some data. Suppose that we want to create a data frame that contains data related to some students. The first option for creating such a data frame is to first creating a nested list of students and then pass this nested list to the data frame constructor. So here I say students list equals to a nested list that contains four students. The first student is Bob, his last name is William, he is 26 years old, studying computer, and his score is 86. The next one is Emma, and her last name is Johnson, she is 23, studying math, and her score is 92. Sarah Smith, 22 years old, chemistry, and her score is 95. And the last one, Alex Brown, 21 years old, electrical engineering, and 82. Now we can pass this list to the data frame class constructor. Let's say 
a student's df which is the data frame equals to pd.dataframe and then pass a student's list to it and now let's see the result as you see a student data frame has four rows corresponding to four students and five columns to store five attributes columns as you see are labeled from zero to four we didn't specify labels for our columns and by default pandas use integer numbers as labels also rows are labeled from zero to three Again, this is the default behavior of data frame when you don't explicitly define your index. I'm sure that you agree that integer labels for columns are not meaningful at all. It would be better to have columns with labels like first name, last name, age, and so on. Fortunately, we can specify labels for our columns. To do so, we just need to set the columns parameter to a list of labels. So now, let me copy this from here to here and this time I set columns to a list of proper labels and now let's see our new data frame as you can see this time instead of integer labels columns have meaningful labels also you can specify index for each row for example here the index can be students identity number or email we can specify index for our data frame by passing a list to index argument into pd.dataframe class constructor so let me copy the last statement from here and this time I set the index parameter index equals to a list of emails and now let's see the result as you see this time instead of having numbers as index we have email for each student as its index now that you learned how to convert the nested list into a data frame let's go ahead and see how to convert a dictionary to a pandas data frame First, let's create a dictionary where the keys of dictionary correspond to column name and the values are a list, which corresponds to the column values in the pandas data frame. First, as I said, I create a dictionary. For example, a student underscore dict equals to a dictionary which has five keys corresponding to five columns in data frame. First name, last name, age, major, and the score. For each key, the value is a list containing that attribute for all the students. For example, for name, I have a list containing the first name of all the students, which is Bob, Emma, Sarah, and Alex. And let's define other attributes as well. And now we just need to pass this dictionary to pd.dataframe. So here I say a students underscore df2 equals to pd.dataframe, and I pass the student's dict as input argument. And now let's see the result. As you can see, this time you don't need to pass columns labels separately because the keys of the dictionary are used as columns labels. But what happens if I pass columns argument? For example, let's set the columns to just last name and a score and see the result. As you see by doing this, you say pandas that you just need these two columns and pandas ignore the rest of columns. Also, let's see what happens if you specify columns which don't exist in the dictionary. For example, here I add city which doesn't exist in the dictionary. In this case, pandas creates a data frame with all the specified columns, but set values to none for those that don't exist. It makes sense because we don't have any value for city. Now that we have learned how to create a data frame, let's take a quick look at its attributes and methods. Here first, let me show you a student's underscore df. As I told you, data frame has some columns and rows. To see the columns, we can use columns attribute and it returns a list-like structure of columns. Also, we can see the index of data frame using index attribute. Apart from these two attributes, there is another attribute called shape, which gives you the number of rows and columns. Here I type a student underscore df dot shape and the output means the data frame has four rows and five columns. Sometimes you want to take a quick look at your data frame. In these situations, you can use head and tail method. The head method by default shows the first five rows of the data frame, but also you can pass a number to limit the number of rows. Here I type a student underscore df dot head and as an input argument, I pass two, which returns two first row of the data frame. Similarly, you can use tail method to see the last rows of the data frame. Finally, I wanna show you two handy functions that give you a summary of your data set. The first one is info method. 
This method gives you a list of all columns with their data type and the number of non-null values in each column. Also, you can see the number of rows as well as the memory usage of your dataset. The other method is describe, which is used to view some basic statistical details like mean, standard deviation, and percentiles of numeric columns of your data frame. Here for our data frame, because we have just two numerical columns, we see some statistical details for these two columns. Well done! In this video, you learned about data frame, which is the most important data structure in Pandas. Also, you learned how to convert basic Python structures such as list and dictionary to a data frame. In the next video, you will see how to import your data from a file into a data frame. So take care to the next video. Hello and welcome back. In the previous video, you learned how to create Pandas data frame from scratch. But almost in all data analysis projects, we are given a file containing data and instead of creating data frame from scratch, we need to load data from the file into a data frame. The data can be given in a CSV file format, spreadsheets, or any other formats. But because of the popularity and simplicity of CSV files, in this introductory course, we just focus on reading CSV files. Often, you will work with data in CSV files and run into problems at the very start of your workflow. In this video, you will see how you can use the read underscore CSV function from Pandas to deal with common problems when importing data. In this video, I will use five sample datasets to show you how to read CSV files. If you go to the chapter 2 directory and then codes directory, there you can find a folder named dataset which contains all these five datasets. Each of these datasets have some issue in reading and during this video, we will learn how to solve these issues. As before, to use pandas, we need to import it. So I type import pandas as pd. Pandas has several functions to read different file formats. If you type pd dot and then type read, you see lots of functions that start with read, such as read underscore csv, read underscore excel, and so on. To import a csv file into Python, we use read underscore csv function from pandas library. As you see, this function has lots of argument, but except the first one, which is the file pass of our dataset, all of them are optional because they have default value. So here, let's just pass the file pass to this function. The first CSV file in dataset folder is data underscore zero one.csv. But before we read it in Python, let's open it in text editor and take a look at its content. This is the content of our first dataset. As you see, in each row we have information for a student. The first row is called headers that refers to the column names of our dataset. So here we have four columns, first name, last name, experience, and a score. Also, you see that the fields are separated with comma here. Now that you saw the original CSV file, let's get back to Python and try to read it. Because the dataset is in dataset folder, the file path would be dataset slash data underscore zero one dot csv. And I store the result of this function into a variable named df, which stands for data frame. Now let's see the result. It's amazing. With just one line of code, we could read the csv file. And read underscore csv did all the things for us separating all attributes and samples and store the data into a data frame. You see all four columns here as you saw in the original text file. Great. Well, we successfully read the first dataset and now let's continue and read the second dataset. Like before, I just type df2 equals to pd.read underscore csv and then pass the file pass of our second dataset to it. And now let me show the result. Well, at the first glance, everything looks good, but there is a problem in reading this dataset. Can you find a problem? That's right. As you see, this time we don't have labels for our columns. Instead, the first row of dataset is mistaken for the labels. But why did this happen? Let's take a look at original dataset file and compare it with the previous one. This is the original dataset. As you see, the second dataset does not have header line. Header line is usually expected to be the first line of our dataset. But for some dataset, the headers may be completely missing, partially missing, or they might exist, but you may want to rename them. How can we deal with such issues effectively with pandas? Well, let's get back to the code. Let's start with the situation where headers are completely missing, like our dataset. 
In this case, first we have to set header argument and read CSV function to none. This tells pandas that hey, my dataset does not have any headers line. Please don't consider the first line as headers. Now let's try this one and see the result again. Great, we are one step closer. This time pandas didn't consider the first line as header, but we don't have labels for our data frame columns. Instead of having meaningful labels, we have integer labels 0, 1, 2, 3. To specify names for our columns, we can set the names argument in read underscore CSV method. So let's add names equals to a list including the names for our columns. Okay, now let's see the result. Well, as you see, everything looks good. Sometimes your dataset has a header line, but for some reason, for example, the headers are incomplete or headers are unclear, you want to use your own names for columns. In this case, because the headers exist, we have to tell pandas to skip the first row and don't use that as headers. For example, let's read the first dataset again, but instead of using the header line, set our names. Well, here I typed df1 equals to pd.read underscore csv and then pass the file pass for our first dataset. It's dataset slash data underscore 01.csv. Now, as I told you, set the skip rows argument to 1, which means ignore the first line, and now set your names for your columns. Now, let's see the result. Well done. As you see, Instead of using the header line, our columns are labeled with character A, B, C, D. Okay, everything looks good. Now let's move to the third dataset. To read the third dataset, I type df3 equals to pd.read underscore csv and then pass its file pass, which is dataset slash data underscore 03.csv. And let me print the result. There is a problem in reading this file. As you see, data frame just has one column. If I print the length of df.columns, it shows one, which confirms that data frame just has one column. But what is the problem here? Let's take a look at the original data file. Well, this data set, instead of comma, attributes are separated by vertical pipe character. And the problem is here. Read underscore CSV function assumes that data are separated by comma or we should explicitly define the separator character. To do this, we need to set the sep argument in read underscore CSV method. So let's go back to the code and here set the sep argument to pipe character. And now let's see the result. Great, we loaded this dataset to pandas data frame. Now let's move on to the next dataset. For the fourth dataset, I type df4 equals to pd.read underscore csv and pass its file pass. And here is the result. Well, there is a problem in reading this file too. Again, let's go and see the original dataset. As you see here, the first few lines are a description of our dataset. And we should ignore these lines. Fortunately, all these lines start with a number sign character which will help us. To fix this issue, we have to set comment argument in read underscore CSV function. I set the comment to number sign, which tells pandas that all the lines with number sign at the beginning are comment and should be ignored in reading the dataset. Now let's see the result. We still have some problems in reading the dataset. As you see here, the fields are separated with backslash T with tab character. So I have to set the separator to backslash t to successfully read the dataset. So I type sep equals to backslash t. Well, as you see, we read the dataset successfully. And now let's move to the last dataset. I usually read the dataset in the simplest way by just passing its file pass and see what is the result. So in this case, I say df5 equals to pd.read underscore csv and the file pass for the last dataset. This time the situation is worse. I got an error in reading the dataset. It says error tokenizing data. Expected one fields in line four, but saw four. Again, to find the root of the problem, let's look at the original CSV file. As you see here, when pandas read the first line, it says because the default separator is comma, and in the first row, I can't see any comma, so data just has one column or one field. 
everything is okay until reading the line 4. In line 4, Pandas expects one field like previous lines but C4, and this is the reason for the error. But we know that the main problem is that the first three lines are description, and we have to ignore these lines. Unlike the previous dataset, these lines don't start with a specific comment symbol. So here, I cannot use comment argument in read underscore CSV. Instead, I use a skip rows argument and set it to 3, which means please skip the first three rows. So let's go back to the code. Here, I set the skip rows argument to 3. And now let's see the result. Great. The data is loaded to the data frame without any problem. In this video, you learned how to read CSV file and how to solve some common issues you encounter in reading these files. Now we have loaded our data into a data frame and we are ready to work with data frame and process our data set. So stay with me in the next video and I show you how to process your data set. Hello and welcome back. In the previous video, you learned how to read your data and store it in a data frame. Now, I'm going to show you how to extract part of your data frame using selection operation. The selection operation means selecting part of a data frame for subsequent processing. For example, in this data frame, how can we select the name column? Or how can we select multiple columns like name and gender at the same time? Or even how can we extract all female users? You know both rows and columns in data frame has labels and we can use either labels or integer locations of rows and columns to select part of data. This dual selection capability makes pandas data structures very powerful for selecting subset of data. In this video, you will first learn to select columns using indexing operator, I mean square brackets. And then I will show you how to select part of a data frame using two data frame attributes called iLock and lock. Finally, you will see how to use filtering or Boolean selections, in which you select some rows and columns based on a given condition. Well, let's get straight into coding. Great. But before we start, let me mention that we will use some real and publicly available datasets for the rest of this course. For this session, I'm going to use a dataset called Titanic. This dataset contains information about the passengers who died or survived the Titanic disaster. Although this is a publicly available dataset and you can find it easily on the internet, you can find it in the dataset folder in the chapter 2 directory. So you can access this dataset and come along with me in coding. Well, before everything, we need to import pandas. So I type import pandas as pd. Now let's read the dataset using pd.read underscore csv. So I type df equals to pd.read underscore csv. And because the data file in the dataset folder, its file path would be dataset slash titanic.csv. Well, now let's see the data frame. Great job, we successfully read the dataset from the file. To check the data frame size, we can use shape attribute from the data frame. And it says the data frame has 891 rows and 12 columns. And what are the columns? Just type df.columns. Great, it has 12 columns, passenger ID, survived, P class, and so on. And what are the indexes? To see the indexes, just type df.index. Now that we have a general overview of the data frame, let's see how can we select part of our data frame. In order to select a column in pandas data frame, we can use bracket notation and then type the name of the column inside the square brackets. For example, if you want to select age column, you can type ages equals to df and inside the square bracket type age. And if you see the result, this is the age column from the dataset. And what is the type of ages? It's a pandas series. And because it's a pandas series, we can perform all the operations which pandas series supports. For example, we can say ages.mean, which gives us the average age for our data frame. Or we can say ages.max, which gives us the maximum age for our data frame. Great. Also, to get multiple columns of data frame, you just need to pass a list of names in square brackets. For example, if you want to get name and age at the same time, you can type 
df and inside the bracket I pass a list of all the names of columns which I want. So I type name and age. This time the result is itself a data frame with two columns. When you are using columns labels, make sure to correctly type the spelling of columns name because it's case sensitive, which means if you type df and inside the bracket type age with lower a, you will get a key error. As a bonus tip, if the column's name is one word, you can access the column like an attribute. For example, to get the age column, you can say df.h. But be careful that if the column name is not one word, I mean there is a space inside the label of the column, you cannot access it using dot notation. To this point, you are able to select one or multiple columns from a data frame. Now let's move on to a more general case. Suppose you want to select a part of a data frame including some rows and columns. To specify rows and columns, you can use their locations or labels. Pandas data frame has two attributes named loc and iloc that helps us to perform such these queries very easily. iloc, which stands for integer location, is used to select part of a data frame using integer locations. And loc can be used for selecting based on columns labels and rows index. For example, let's get the first row and second and fifth column. Here, because rows and columns are specified based on their integer locations, we use iloc. So I type df.iloc and inside the bracket, I type a comma. Before comma, I put the rows numbers and after comma is the place where I can specify columns numbers. Because locations index start from zero, I say zero and one, four for columns, which means first row and second and fifth column. And here is the result. As you see, the result is pandas series, a data frame which has one row and two columns. Alternatively, I can use loc to get the same result, but instead of using integer locations, we should use labels. As you see, the index for first row is zero in this data frame, and the labels for second and fifth column are survived and sex. So I type df.loc and inside the bracket I type 0 and then after comma I pass a list of names survived and sex. So let's see the result. As you see the result is the same as before. We can also use a slice in iloc and loc operators. For example to select first five rows and first three columns I can type df.iloc and inside the bracket for rows I say colon 5 which means the first five rows and colon 3 for columns which means the first three columns and let's see the result please note that iloc has exclusive behavior that means it doesn't include the upper bound for rows and columns as you see here the upper bound for rows is 5 but it doesn't include in the rows here as another example let's get first and last rows and just the last three columns so I type df.iloc and to specify the first and last rows we can type 0 and minus 1 for rows and minus 3 colon for specifying the last three columns and this is the result. We can also use a slice in loc attribute for example to select rows with index between 5 and 10 and columns from name to ticket I can type df.loc and inside the bracket I type 5 colon 10 which means the rows with index between 5 and 10 and columns name colon ticket which means the columns between name and ticket. Great, however note that the loc attribute is inclusive which means it includes the upper bound in a slice. So as you see, row with index 10 and column ticket are included in the result. Good job. As you saw, it's very easy and straightforward to extract specific rows and columns from a data frame using loc and iloc. Now let's see some conditional selection. For example, suppose that we want all the male passengers. For this query, because the condition is based on sex column, first I need to access sex column by typing df.sex. 
and now I use comparison operator to create a boolean series. So I type df.sex equal male and it gives me a boolean series which is true for the passengers who are male. Now we can pass this boolean series to lock to filter the date frame. I can type df.loc and for rows I copy this statement from here and for columns I don't pass anything because I want all columns. As you see we got the expected result, a data frame that just contains male passengers. As another example, let's select all female passengers who are over 35 years old. Here we have two conditions. It says female passengers, which is a condition on the sex column, and the other condition is over 35, which is a condition on the age column. To get all female passengers, we can type df.sex equals to female. And to get all passengers who are over 35, we can say df.h is greater than 35. And now we just need to combine these two Boolean stories using logical pointwise and operator and pass the result to loc attribute of the data frame to filter the data frame. So I type df.loc and inside the score brackets I have two filters which are combined using and operator. The first one is df.sex equals to female and the second one is df.age greater than 35. And now let's see the result. As you can see the output data frame just contains female passengers who are over 35 years old. Well done. In this video you learned how to select a part of data frame in different ways. Now you are able to select rows and columns based on integer locations using iloc or based on their labels using loc or based on conditions. In the next video you will see how to explore your data and do some basic analysis on it. So stay with me in the next video. Hello and welcome back. Now that you learned how to read your data into a data frame, it's time to talk about data pre-processing, which is the first step in data analysis project. During the course of doing data analysis, a significant amount of time is spent on data pre-processing, including data cleaning and data transformation. These tasks are often very repetitive and time-consuming but Pandas provides us with a high level and fast set of tools that enable us to convert data into the right form. In this video, I'm going to talk about handling missing data as well as duplicates, which are the two most frequent issues you encounter when working on real world datasets. Missing data or missing values occur when no value is stored for a variable in an observation. For example, a respondent may refuse to state their age while completing a survey. So there will be a missing value for age attribute for that respondent. Another issue in real-world dataset is duplicate rows. Sometimes a data frame may have duplicate rows and it's necessary to remove these duplicated rows before subsequent analysis. In this video, first you will learn how to check if there is any missing value in your data or not. Then you will find out how to handle missing values by removing rows and columns which contain missing values. Afterward, you will see another option for handling missing values which is the replacement with another value. Finally, you will see how to find and remove duplicates in your data frame. Now, let's jump into code and see them in practice. Welcome to the coding section. In this video, again, we will work on Titanic dataset. So, first let me import pandas, then I read the dataset. Here is the dataset. If we take a closer look at the dataset, we will see that the age column is not available for all rows. For example, consider the row 888. If you look at the age field, you see NaN value, which means that the age is missing for this sample. In order to check whether our dataset contains missing values or not, we can use the ethna method for the data frame. This method returns a Boolean data frame that indicates whether each cell contains a null value or not. To see which columns have missing values, we can say df.isna and then use any to aggregate all rows. For each column, it returns true if that column contains any missing value. So as you see, the age, cabin, and embarked columns have missing values. Great. Now that we know that there are some missing values in our dataset, let's see how we can handle this problem. Generally, we have two options to handle missing values. We can remove the rows or columns that have missing values, or we can replace missing values with another value. First, let's see how we can remove missing values. 
To remove missing values, we can call dropNA method for the date frame. So I say df.dropNA. As I told you, we have two options, removing rows or removing columns. To specify what you would like to do, you can set access input argument. Setting access to zero means dropping rows and setting it to one means dropping columns. First, let me remove all rows with NaN value. So I set access to zero. And here I have to mention that this method and many other data frame methods, instead of changing the original data frame, return a new data frame. So you have to store the result as a new data frame. And here I type DF2 equals to this statement. And here is the DF2. To make sure that there is no missing value in DF2, we can call isNA for DF2. And the output tells us that there is no any missing value in all the data frame. But let's see how many rows are removed from the data frame. To do this, we compare the shape of the original data frame with the new data frame. As you see, the second data frame has fewer number of rows. About 80% of rows are dropped, but they both have 12 columns. As I told you, most of methods of data frame don't change the original data frame. However, we can usually set the in place argument to true to keep changes in the original data frame. For example, if I say df.dropNA and then set the in place argument to true, the changes will apply on the original data frame. To confirm this, let's see the shape of the original data frame. As you see, the number of rows has decreased to 183, and it means that the original data frame has changed. Great. However, dropping rows and columns are very easy, but we unfortunately lose part of our data set. Specifically, when the number of samples is small, removing data points can significantly affect the conclusion drawn from the data. In this situation, a good strategy for dealing with missing values is to replace them with another value. For example, if the column is numerical, like age column, we can replace the missing values with the average value of the column. Or if the column is categorical, we can replace the missing values with the most frequent value of the column. In order to replace missing values, we can use fillNA function. This function has an input argument named value, which is a constant or any array-like structures. Here, before we continue, first let me to read the dataset again, because I changed it in the previous code. Now let's say df.fillNA and pass 0 as the first argument. It will replace all the missing values with 0 and return a new data frame. And I store the new data frame as df2. And here is the data frame. As you see, all the missing values are replaced with 0. For example, consider the row 888 and age field, which is 0. Also, to make sure that this data frame doesn't have any missing value, we can use isNA method. Now let me fill missing values with the average value of the column. To do this, here I say df.fillNA and instead of passing a constant as input argument, I say df.mean, which means I want to replace the missing values with the average of that column. But because we cannot compute the average for all columns, I mean non-numerical columns, I set the numeric only argument to true. And finally, I save the result as df3. And here is the df3. As you see here, the age related to row 888 is replaced by 29.699118, which is the average age for all the data frame. Now, for non-numerical columns, I say df3.fillNA and pass df.mode to change the missing values with most frequent items. However, because there may be more than one frequent item in each column, I need to say .iloc0 to get the first most frequent item. And I store the result in df4. And here is the df4. As you see, no missing value can be seen in cabin and embarked. And to confirm that there is no missing value in the data frame, we can use isNA for df4. Well done. So far you have learned how to handle missing values in your data frame. Now let's continue to see how we can handle duplicate rows. To see if there are any duplicate rows in your data frame, you can use duplicated methods for the data frame. So if I type df.duplicated, it returns a boolean service which shows which rows are duplicate. And if I type df.duplicated, that any, it shows false, which means that there is no any duplicate rows in our data frame. But let me manually copy some rows. I want to copy the first three rows and add them to the end of the data frame. To do this, I use pd.concat, which concat a tuple of data frames that are passed as the first argument. 
So I say pd.concat and as argument I pass a tuple which the first element is df, the original data frame, and the second element is the first three rows of the data frame. And I can say df.iloc colon three. And I store the result as df underscore duplicate. Hello and welcome back. In the previous video, we started the pre-processing phase by learning to handle missing data and removing duplicate rows. Sometimes before the main analysis, we need to modify our data frame structure. This involves removing columns or rows, changing the format of existing data, or creating derived features from other columns. Pandas provides a powerful set of tools to modify our data frame structure, and this video will demonstrate how to perform these powerful and important operations. In this video, we will first learn how to rename columns in a data frame. Then you will see how to add a new column to the data frame. After that, you will see how to concatenate two data frames. And finally, you will learn how to remove columns or rows using drop method from the data frame. So stay tuned and let's jump into the coding section. Great. For this video, we will use employee dataset, which you can find in dataset folder. And it contains information about 1000 employees. Well, first, let me import pandas and read this dataset. Good job. First of all, to have a quick overview of dataset, let's see the shape of our data frame. It says that the data frame has 1000 rows and 8 columns. And also, we can take a look at the first 5 rows using head method. Also, we can see columns label using column attribute of the data frame. Sometimes, for some reason, we would like to rename the columns. For example, consider the first name you can see a space between first and name. This is annoying because this extra space makes a column inaccessible using dot notation. For example, we can access gender column by typing df.gender, but we can't access first name because there is a space between first and name. But don't worry, renaming columns of data frame is very easy. Columns can be renamed using the rename method. You just need to pass a dictionary as a mapper. Here I want to remove space from columns label. So I type df.rename and inside the parentheses as argument, I have to pass a dictionary as I told you. And inside the dictionary, I add a pair of key value for each column I want to rename. The keys are current labels and the values are new labels. So let me copy the labels from here and paste it here. Well, First name is the current label and I want to change it to first name without a space. So the value would be first underscore name. There is no any problem with gender column so I can easily remove it from dictionary. For a start date again there is a space and I have to change it. Also we have to change the last login time because there is a space in it. I can ignore salary because there is no problem with that. For bonus I don't want the person symbol so I can rename it to bonus. Also, I have to rename senior management and I can ignore the team. Great. Now, because I want to rename columns, I have to set access argument to one. Now let's run this command and see the result. As you can see, columns label are changed. However, using rename method in this manner doesn't change the original data frame. Instead, it returns a new data frame with renamed columns and the data copied from the original data frame. To verify this, let's see the columns attribute of the original data frame again. So I type df.columns. As you see, the original data frame has not changed. But like other methods of data frame, to modify the original data frame, we can use the in place parameter and set it to true. So let's copy the statement from here to here and I set the in place argument to true. Now let's see the original data frames column. Great. Now that you learned how to rename the columns, let's see how we can add a new column to our data frame. Before I show you how to add a new column, let's again take a look at the data frame. As you see, the bonus feature is a floating number. Suppose we want the bonus to be integer number. So I decide to add a new column called bonus2 that contains integer version of bonus column. At the first step, I need to access bonus column by saying df.bonus. And then I use round method to round the numbers to nearest integer number. And here is the result. As you can see, the numbers don't have floating points. Now I have to store the result as a new column named bonus2. 
To do so, I use bracket notation like this, diff and inside the bracket, I type the name of new column, which is bonus2. And now, let's see our date frame. As you see, the column bonus2 has been added to the date frame. This new column is sometimes called a derived column because it's derived by processing of another existing column. Sometimes you may also want to add a new column that has its own values. I mean, it's not derived from any other existing column. For example, suppose that I want to assign a random weight to each employee. Because in this problem I need to create random numbers, I need to import NumPy package. So first, let me import NumPy as NP. Now to create a series object, I call series class constructor and as an argument, I pass an array of random numbers. To create a random array, I use random module from NumPy package by typing np.random.randing and as input argument I have to specify lower and upper bound for random numbers as well as the length of array which is 1000 the same as the number of rows in our data frame great now let's see the result as you see I have a series with random numbers now this is the time to add this series to data frame to this end like before I use bracket notation here I type df and inside the bracket I have to specify the name of new column. And now let's see the result. As you see, the random column is added to the date frame. Great. Now let's go ahead and see how we can add new rows to our date frame. Adding one or multiple rows to a data frame is similar to concatenating two data frames. And for this purpose, we can use concat function from pandas package. First, let me extract the first two rows of our original data frame. So I type df.iloc colon 2, which means the first two rows, and I store the result as df2. Now suppose that we want to add these two rows to our original data frame. As I told you, we can use concat function from pandas package. So I type pd.concat. Concat function gets a tuple of data frames that we want to concatenate, as well as access argument, which specifies the direction we want to concatenate data frames. Here the first data frame is original data frame which is df and the other one is df2. And because we want to combine data frames across rows, we set access argument to zero. And finally, I store the result in df3. Now let's see the result. Great, the first two rows are added to the end of the original data frame. But as you see, the index of second data frame are considered for this combination. And if you don't want this, you can set ignore index to true in concat function. Here I copy the last statement and I set ignore index to true. And this time the index of second data frame are not considered for combination. Great. Now let's go on and see how we can remove columns or rows from the data frame. To remove columns or rows from a data frame, we can use the drop method. For example, in our data set, assume that the first name is not important in our analysis and I decide to remove it. To get rid of it, I can say df.drop and as input argument, I have to pass a list of columns name that I want to remove. And because here I just want to remove the first name column, I just add the first name to the list. And also because we are going to remove columns, I have to set access to one. And finally, I store the result in df4. And let's see the df4. Well, as you see, the first name is removed in our new data frame. But like before, the original data frame has not changed. And if you want to apply changes to the original data frame, you have to set in place argument to true. Removing rows can be done in the same way. For example, suppose that we want to remove the first five rows of the data frame. To this end, I can say df.drop and as input argument, I have to pass the index for first five rows which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I use range function here. And because we are going to remove rows, we have to set axis to 0. And now let's see the result. As you see, the first five rows are deleted from the data frame. Great. In this video, you learned how to do several common data manipulation on pandas data frame object, specifically ones that change the structure of the data frame by adding or removing rows or columns. In the next video, you will learn the last step of pre-processing data, which is transforming data into a proper format. So stay with me in the next video.
Hello and welcome to the last video of data pre-processing. As the final step in data pre-processing in this video, I'm going to show you how to convert data to categorical data type. Categorical data type is one of the data type in Pandas that represents a feature with limited number of values. By the end of this video, you will learn how to convert a string data to categories and how to discretize a continuous variables and convert it to categorical feature. So let's go ahead and jump into code. In this video, we will use employee data set again. So first, let me import pandas, and then I can load the data set. Often data includes the text columns with limited number of values. Features like country, gender, or degree are always repetitive. These are the examples of categorical data. Categorical variables can take only a limited and usually fixed number of possible values. Consider the gender column in our data set. Gender just has two distinct values, male and female. To find the frequency of each label in this column, I can use value counts method. Here I type df.gender.valueCounts. It says that 431 rows are female and 424 are male. Also, don't forget that there are some NaN value for this column. To find the number of NaN value, we can use isNA method. Here I type df.gender. That is an A. And to find the number of NAND value in this column, I use SUM method. So, there are 145 rows with NAND value. As I said, because the number of unique values in this column is limited, it's better to convert it to categorical data type. To convert a column to categorical type, we can use pd.categorical function. Now, let's convert the gender column to categorical. To this end, we can type pd.categorical and as input argument, I pass the gender column. The result is a pandas categorical array. And now let's add it to our data frame as a new column named gender2. So here I assign the output to df gender2. If we take a look at the head of our data frame, we see that these two columns seems identical, but actually categorical column has number of advantages. One of the main advantage of converting a string data type to categorical is reducing the memory usage. You can see the number of bytes used for each column by calling memory usage for the data frame. Here I enter df.memoryUsage. Here, as you see, there is a huge difference between the number of bytes for gender and gender2. In order to show you the other advantage of categorical data, let me first add a new column called test score to our data frame. Suppose that this column represents the score in terms of discrete labels, like very low, low, medium, high, and very high. To create a random column with these labels, I use choices function from random library. So first let me import random library, and now I say random.choices. As input argument, I pass a list of labels, which is very low, low, medium, high, and very high. Also, we have to set the parameter k, which shows the length of the list we want to create. Here, because I have 1000 employee, I set the k parameter to 1000. And here is the result. Now, I can pass this list to series constructor to create a series. So here I type pd.series, and I put the statement inside the parentheses. As you see, the output is a pandas series, and now I can add it to our data frame. Now, let's take a look at the head of our data frame. The new column is added to our data frame and let's check its data type by typing df.dtypes. It says the score is object or a string. Now let's convert this column to categorical. To do this, again, I say pd.categoricals and pass column to this function. If you take a look at the categories here, you see that the order of categories does not represent the order of labels. By default, categories are sorted by lexical order. And to change the order, we have to set two additional parameters. First, we have to pass a list of ordered labels to this function. So here in pd.categorical, I set categories to a list. And inside the list, I enter the labels. Also, we have to set the ordered parameter to true. Now, if you take a look at the categories, you see that there is a relationship between the categories. Very low is lower than low, low is lower than medium and so on. Now let's add this column to our data frame. So here I assign the output to df 
score 2. Now you can see the other advantage of categorical data type. It enables you to perform comparison operations. Suppose that you want to know the number of people who are above medium. You can just say df.score2 is greater than medium. And the result is a Boolean series. And if you take a sum over this panda series, you can get the number of people that their score is higher than medium. It says that 383 people are above the medium. Well, now that you know how to convert the strings to categorical, let's go ahead and see another type of categorical data, which is the result of discretization. Discretization or binding is the conversion of continuous variable into a categorical variable. Let's again take a look at our data frame. In our data frame, we have a column named salary, which is a numerical and continuous variable. Suppose that we want to discretize this continuous column into five categories. First, let's see how much is the minimum and maximum salary for our data set. To find minimum and maximum, we can use mean and max method for this column. So I type df.salary.mean and df.salary.max. Suppose that we want to split this range, I mean from 35,000 to 150,000 to five categories including very low, low, medium, high and very high. To discretize this column into five categories, we can use cut function from pandas library. So here I say pd.cut and as argument I have to pass the column I want to discretize which is df.salary. Also I have to specify the splitting points or beans. So I set the parameter beans to a list of numbers. Here I say 35,000, 50,000, 75,000, 100,000, 125,000 and 150,000. This means that the first category is between 35,000 to 50,000 and the second one is between 50,000 to 75,000 and so on. Also, we need to specify labels for our categories. So I set the parameter labels to a list of labels. And now let's see the result. As you can see, the output is a categorical series. And now let's add it to our data frame as a new column called cat salary, which means categorical salary. So here I assign the output to df and inside the bracket I type cat salary. And now let's take a look at the data frame. As you see, for example, for the first row, the salary is 97,000 a year. So it falls in medium category and medium is set to cat salary column. Here again, if you take a look at memory usage of data frame, you will find there is a big difference between memory usage of salary and cat salary. In this video, you learned how to convert a string and numerical data to categorical data in order to reduce the memory usage. In the next chapter, you will see how to process different data type including a string, numerical, and date time objects. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To get the files the instructor used in this tutorial and follow along, click over there. And click over there to watch more videos on YouTube from Simon Says It.